Next on the agenda is Dr. John Schufelt. Um, he has so many initials after his name. Uh, he's, he is a, a medical doctor, an emergency um, physician. He's a JD, has a law degree, and has an MBA. And he's going to talk to us today regarding um, disruptive docs. I suspect this will be completely new to everybody in this audience. So bear with me. This is a, um, it's a moderately long presentation that I'll do relatively quickly. Um, Sometimes I think it's important to look back where our roots are. And if you look at the roots of medicine, there's probably four people who consider the fathers of healthcare. Um, certainly Osler, Welch, Kelly, and Halstead. And to kind of give you some perspective of where they were um, when they were practicing medicine in the late 1800s, uh, wealthy patients were getting surgery in their home. Antiseptic or sterile technique was just starting to be used in the hospital. And Halstead was performing surgery using the cocaine as a general anesthetic. And he was also using that himself, but uh, it's a little different story. When, when Osler left the University of Pennsylvania, he gave this address to the medical students. I'm just going to read you a small snippet of. In the first place, in the physician or surgeon, no quality takes rank with imperturbability. And I propose for a few minutes to direct your attention to this essential bodily virtue. Imperturbability means coolness and presence of mind under all circumstances. Calmness amid storm, clearness of judgment in moments of grave peril, and mobility and impassiveness. And I won't read this whole thing, but basically it was on to say that if you're not born with it, you can develop it with some education. And it really struck me as is really interesting that more than 100 years ago, he felt it important to talk to medical students about the ability to remain calm in situations and, and unflappable, which kind of was what brings me here today. As I, as I mentioned to you, I suspect. Uh, you know nothing about disruptive physicians here at Maricopa Medical Center. It's only about 3 to 5% of physicians, and from what I know of my colleagues here, uh, I can't imagine anybody works here who fits this mold. So this is the talk where you can go to other places, and you can start to pick out disruptive physicians amongst your peer group and see if you can direct them into uh, the right treatment paths or the right alternatives. Now, truth be told, I would not be standing here today if it weren't for a couple of disruptive physicians. Um, since I was about four years old, I always wanted to become a surgeon, and I always wanted to become, go into CT surgery. So I read this book on Kool-Aid, and I read this book about the bakey called Hearts, and I was dead set. Until going to medical school, I spent about two of the longest weeks of my life with two of the biggest psychopaths I've ever met in my life. <laughs> they were, um, pardon the expression, the ass-grabbing, instrument-throwing physicians we all loathe. And I, as I hung out with them and scrubbed into their oral procedures, I thought, you know, there is no way I would end up like, like these two lunatics. And I ended up going into emergency medicine and, and found a whole new group of lunatics. <laughs> so when I think of disruptive physicians, this song always comes to mind. You, you may recognize it, but a lot of times when disruptive physicians act out, this is what, this is what we tell them because the fallout from their behavior can really be catastrophic. So let's talk about ideal physician qualities. And, and you all know them, so I'm not going to read them to you. But basically, they have to be, deal with empathy, uh, forthrightness, confidence, handling stress, punctuality, self-motivation. And even if you go back to Marcus Aurelius in time of uh, ancient Rome, thou must be like a promontory of the sea against which the waves be continually, yet it both itself stands, and about it are those swelling waves stilled and quieted. Think how many times you're in a stressful situation, everybody around you is panicking, and they always rely on the physician and the providers and nursing staff to remain even keeled. It's never good freaking out in front of patients because they tend to internalize that and generally do worse. Ask Kelso for stuff, thing. Shoot, I'm getting that on a time later today. What a difference. A day he goes on to beat up most of the medical staff, and so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll quit it there. So some disruptive physician examples, just so I know we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, a nurse didn't comply quickly enough, a doctor asked them, are you too fat or too stupid to do what I asked you to do? A surgeon entering the room said, this woman is unacceptable. If you put her in my room, I won't do surgery. I'll get your license taken away if you come into my room again. And, and the list kind of goes on and on. What I'm trying to impart is don't let your life serve as a warning to others. This is what I tell my children. Watch what I do, and then like George on Seinfeld, do the opposite. 
Do not let, it can only be the purpose of your life, it's to serve as a warning to others. So don't let this be you. So, Captain America, I think not. Captain America wrestled with a burrito in his pants. This was out of a news article. A physician in Melbourne, Florida, dressed up as Captain America and stuffed a burrito down his pants. He went to a local bar with a number of other medical professionals and began getting too forward with women, asking them if he wanted to squeeze, my bur squeeze his burrito. About that time, the police showed up, arrested the burrito packing person, physician, and arrested him. You can see him there in the booking chamber in the jail. And the funny part was, as he was trying to stuff the burrito down the toilet, he also had some marijuana that fell into the toilet as well, unbeknownst to him. He didn't know who put it there. And, uh, and I don't know if you've ever been in jail or not, but apparently the toilets don't flush. So anything you throw down there stays there, and, and hence uh, he got busted. Chief of neurosurgery at Oakland Hospital um, came, in, came in intoxicated when someone tried to stop him. Um, he said this was a life-threatening, life-saving uh, life procedure he needed to do, although he had a the person had a fractured spine. They realized he was intoxicated, took a swing at the deputies, yelled at the nurses, and uh, did not have a good outcome after that. Here's a letter from an emergency physician in, 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 up, in, up in the Pacific Northwest, and you obviously can't read it, but basically the long and the short of it is he goes into great lengths on Craigslist, is where it was published, called an open letter to, from an ER doctor, drug seekers everywhere. And when you read it, there's, you know, there's some funny parts of it too, but it, it's really, it's really kind of sad. Because I think if you knew who this person was or had a good idea, anybody in this area could pick out who wrote this letter. Because there's enough information in it that you could probably tell who he was. If he ever got sued, so I, the case I always use is someone comes in the emergency department with back pain, they're a frequent flyer, they may use abuse IV narcotics and oral narcotics, and they ultimately have an epidural abscess which is missed because, hey, it's just a drug seeker. So it gets missed, you know the progression of these, they don't do well, they don't do very well, it sometimes takes a long time to get diagnosed. So he goes up there to defend himself and all of a sudden this thing gets thrown up on the wall of the courtroom and he basically gets completely hung out to dry because what does it make him look like? An unsympathetic, uncaring jerk. So some more behavior, another physician drunk in a hospital, she really lost license, look at this blood alcohol, 0.57, holy cow, I mean, at St. Joe's, she'd be intubated with a 0.57. Um, that, that, I mean, that's an impressive blood alcohol. All right, uh, here's, a doctor, here's a physician who was awarded 1.6 because the chairman of her department said, you're just a little girl, you know you can't do that spine surgery, and then defamed her. So non-ideal physician, be, physician <laughs> behaviors. Doesn't that picture look psychopathic? Um, whether verbal or physical had negatively effects or potentially it's the word that gets you, potentially may affect patient care, constitutes disruptive behavior. That's from the AMA. It can negatively affect learning and work environments. So, some inappropriate things that physicians and others have seen, been seen to do. Intimidation, abusive language, uh, sexual comments or innuendo, sexual harassment, uh, late or unsuitable replies to pages or calls, unprofessional demeanor or conduct. It's kind of a whole smorgasbord about things that are considered disruptive. If you really sit down and think about it, stuff that most of us, I think, learned at the breakfast table or at the dinner table growing up. You know, when I said something stupid, if my father didn't hit me, my sister typically would. In one way or another, I generally learned how to behave, uh, thanks to those two. Although they were a little Machiavellian and Stalin-esque, uh, between them and the nuns, they seemed to work. Um, some more examples of disruptive behavior. Profanity at meetings, disrupting meetings, defiant approach to problems, disrespect, refusal to carry out duties, uh, inappropriate comments written in the medical record. I'll go over some of the ones that I've found in my own practice. Nine pounds in a week? Let me ask you a quick question. Are you trying to make my head explode? Because you have no idea just how frustrating it is working your ass off trying to inflate a tiny little balloon inside someone's clogged artery and all that person has to do really is, oh, I don't know, go for a walk in the morning or choke down a fresh green salad and you come back here looking like that. And I know, I know, here I'm supposed to be Dr. Give a Crap, but you want to know the God's honest truth? And this is a fact. You are what you eat, and you clearly went out and devoured a big fat guy, didn't you? So, I'll admit, there are times when you look at these patients, I had a thing of a guy who was, who was huffing pain, standing on top of a bridge embankment, who then fell off and got run over by a truck, or the guy who got drunk and fell asleep in the trash compactor, and you want to say to them, A, were your parents or first cousins, or B, did Darwin just not know you? because for some reason, evolution did not, did not correspond with this person. But anyway, some other things not to say to a patient I've heard. I don't know what's wrong, I don't have a crystal ball, this one hurt. 
what engage, what in the God's name did you do that for that usually surrounding foreign bodies? What you again, here's were your parents' first cousins. Uh, you may have survived if you wouldn't have waited so long. That's particularly cruel. Uh, and then Darwin obviously didn't know you. And never fight battles with the medical records. We see this commonly. So I help defend physicians and med mal complaints occasionally. And you would be amazed at what's written in the chart where physicians are just absolutely throwing each other under the bus. The, the patient waited for an hour before the nurse saw fit to answer the call light. Due to the anesthesiologist's incompetence, the patient died. This is one of my favorite, but for the nurse's gross stupidity, the patient would be alive today. And then finally, <laughs> this, morbidly, this was written in the emergency medicine chart. This morbidly obese, foul-smelling, drug-seeking indigent showed up yet again today. You now I know this never happens here. Demanding narcotics and being generally obnoxious. And then finally, given the patient's profound stupidity, one wonders how he survived this long. <laughs> These are all written in medical records. Now, who owns the medical record? Generally the challenge, generally the patients. Now, may, maybe they're a little upset at you. They had a copy of their medical record, and they see this. That will not serve you well if they ever decide to sue you or be plain stupid. Uh, the patient's responding only to gravity. Okay, I've got to admit, this one was mine. So we were doing a resuscitation, and there was a student nurse who kept saying to me, doctor, what's the patient's condition? Like, every 30 seconds. I mean, the guy's still dead. I mean, you can see the monitors going like this. Every 30 seconds, doctor, what's the patient's condition? So I find that he's responding only to gravity. So the next thing I look, she's writing that down in the chart. <laughs> yeah, kill me. Um, the child complains of fever, so ne neck and a headache. This was someone who was sent home with meningitis. Patient remains confused, uh, was sent to drive themselves home. And then finally, the patient is OK for discharge. They have no plan. This is the guy who came in with a gun in his mouth that misfired. We called up, this, uh, we called up the uh, um, rotating uh, social service people who came in and said, hey, John, I'm going to send this guy home. And I thought she was kidding. And I said, really? He said, well, yeah, because he has no plan. So he had a gun in his mouth with a bullet in it. He's going to change the bullet. Of course he's got a plan. But anyway, they had written that in the chart. So more examples of bad, bad behavior. Persistent hostility, frequent outburst, blaming or shaming, threatening to get someone fired, sarcasm, threats of violence. These are all things that happen thank God, infrequently in hospitals. Disruptive episodes that are infrequent occurrence with behavior out of character. This is, is it an episode? Someone just lost it, they had a lot of pressure, things just weighed against them for one particular day, and for that moment in time, that snapshot in time, they lost it, or frequent typical behavior for the person does not recognize that their behavior is unacceptable. And in, in my career, the, the people that I've talked to, this is really it. They say, I am not different than any other physician, I'm just able to verbalize my feelings, and I'm really good at verbalizing my feelings. And so for them, this is their outlet to frustration. So this was a cool study. It was done in the Journal of Surgery in 2002, and it was quoted in blank. And here's a, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. So 65 surgeons, about half had two or more lawsuits, half didn't have any. They, they recorded their informed consent discussions that they had with their patients. They washed out the words, so all you could hear was the inflection in their voice. They played that 10-second clip to a group of Harvard undergrads who were able to tell with 97%, 95% uh, accuracy, which physicians had been sued. Now, is that not amazing? And the thing they all said was the condescending tone. They had a condescending tone in that 10-second clip. Again, they washed out the words, they just heard the inflections, that they were more likely to be sued. So at the end of the day, what gets you in trouble with medical boards, with patients and with lawsuits is the quality of care interpersonal skills. We all want to believe it's quality of care, but I think it's probably interpersonal skills. You know, they used to call them the hand holders from the suburbs. They could be killing more people than Dr. Mengele, but no one would sue them. And then you have these, acad these academicians who are absolute rock stars in their profession, and they were getting sued often because their bedside skills weren't up to par. So here's some interesting statistics. 60% um, of physicians said that organizations have received written complaints from patients or their families. 50% uh, of patients have actually changed physicians due to the behavior. And 26% of physicians, which is kind of interesting, admitted to engage in disruptive behavior at one time or another. Now, if you look at the statistics, it's really only about 3 to 5% of physicians who get labeled as quote unquote disruptive. Uh, involves less than 5% of uh, physicians, although 64% of nurses. Uh, have said they've, they've experienced it or witnessed it, and 23% of nurses said they have something that's been thrown at them. Now, that's amazing. Now, I don't know how old this is, but I can't imagine, I, I can't imagine, period, but I can't imagine 23% of nurses felt like they've had something thrown at them. <laughs>